Thank you very much. And welcome everybody to Columbia University uh, and to the School of International Public Affairs uh, Center on Global Energy Policy and to our event today with Chairman Liu Zhenya. And I'll wait for a minute for everybody to get in their earphones. Is the translation working? Welcome. Are the headsets working? Good. My name is David Sandalo. I'm the inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy here at the School of International Public Affairs at Columbia University. And tonight, it is our great honor to welcome to Columbia Chairman Liu Zhenya. Thank you for coming, sir. We've just had the privilege of giving the chairman a short tour of Columbia University. And I was reminded of the traditions of this university um, and its long history uh, as we did that. Uh, and, and of course, in the context of Chinese history, it seems quite short. But this university is actually older than the United States of America. Um, and we're proud, very proud, at the important intellectual traditions that this university has and the work that we continue to do today. Um, uh, tonight, um, we are going to be welcoming um, Chairman Liu Zhenya to campus. And the dean of this school, Dean Merritt Jainau, is very eager to welcome uh, Chairman Liu to this school. She's teaching a class right now. And it's, as soon as she's done with the class, she's going to come up here and she's going to welcome uh, Chairman Liu Zhenya to the campus. So we're looking forward to seeing um, Dean Jainau in about 45 minutes when her class is done. Um, before I introduce Chairman um, Liu Zhenya officially, let me tell you that this is part of a regular series of events that we're doing here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Um, we have a, uh, an event on uh, Wednesday, November 1st, this Wednesday, on the climate negotiations at 6 o'clock um, at Pulitzer Hall. Uh, on November 2nd, on Thursday, we have an event on offshore energy production and next week, we have another event on um, China called We're Next on Climate, U.S.-China Energy and Climate Cooperation. Um, I also want to recognize one especially distinguished guest and a good friend of mine who's with us tonight, Professor Peter Fox Penner from Boston University. Um, we're doing work together uh, in this field and uh, along with um, uh, the Chinese colleagues, and we're, I'm particularly glad that Peter is here tonight. Um, so uh, Chairman Liu Zhenya is well known to everybody here, but he is currently the chairman of the Energy Interconnection Development and Cooperation Organization, or GuideCo. Um, previously, um, Chairman Liu was served as chairman and president of the China State Grid. Under his 12 years of leadership, China State Grid grew to be the world's largest utility, um, and it ranked seventh on Fortune's uh, Global 500 for five consecutive years. Uh, Mr. Liu is a renowned expert in the power sector, a pioneer, of ultra high voltage transmission in China and the initiator of the concept of global energy interconnection. Mr. Liu uh, holds a master's degree in engineering and is a senior engineer with professorships and many distinguished awards. He's going to give remarks tonight, then we're going to have a conversation, he and I, uh, and then we're going to invite people from the audience to ask questions if you'd like to do so. I'm honored to welcome tonight Chairman Liu Zhenya. Professor Sandala, teachers, faculty, students, good afternoon. Thank you very much to invite me to be here. I was invited by the Center on Global Energy Policies, and I would like to share with you the topics of global energy interconnection. And Columbia University has a history of over 260 years, and it is the world top research oriented university. 
In many fields like science, technology, this university is quite contributive and influential in many fields. In the global energy interconnection development and cooperation organization established on March 29th is an international organization dedicated to the world energy sustainable development. And we also do a lot of job in research and development and achieve a lot of results. Based upon the research over the past few years and also of achievements, I would like to talk about the integrated development of energy, information, and transportation integration. Now I'd like to talk about the global energy interconnection, GI. It is the great innovation based upon the UHV grades, because in China, we have a lot of challenges such as tensions in coal, electricity and transportation and regional and seasonal power shortages. So that's why we want to establish the UHV grades so as to transform the China's power generation sector. State grades of China did a lot of research on the UHV and we make a lot of breakthroughs in this field. This technology has breakthroughs in China. Before that, in the United States and other European countries like Japan, USSR, they did a lot of research. And Japan and USSR failed in developing the UHV, but actually they did it in China. In 2009, we have the DC and AC UHV projects, and we also studied their economics and efficiencies in 2012. We also have the intercontinental energy transmission efforts. And also we are inspired by the informatization of the world. We want to establish the energy interconnection. In the past 30 years, we establish the informatization in the world. It is a good inspiration to us why the world can establish an information-based network so that we can be a global village. Why can we build a energy interconnection village in the world? GEI is an infrastructure platform on which clean energy can be developed, transmitted, and consumption. And also, we can Code it like this, smart grid, UHV grid, and clean energy is GEI. So we can use the flexible integration of concentrated and distribution clean power generation. And also we have the overall arrangement of power generation, transmission, storage, and consumption. And also meeting the customers' diversified demands. The UHV grid is the key. Power transmission of thousands of kilometers with tens of, of gigawatts capacity. It also achieves the regional, transfer, uh, transnational, and intercontinental tr interconnection. It also covers the world's major clean energy bases and low centers. And clean energy is the priority. We can use the world's major river hydropower, Arctic wind power, and equatorial solar power. And also we can have the centralized and distributed clean power generation in all countries so as to have the low carbon and green development. Why we should build the GEI here? GEI is an inevitable way out for global energy issues. Currently, the fossil fuels account for 80% of the primary energy consumption. However, only left for 110 years of tapping. 
And also it involves with a lot of uh, climate change. After the industrial age, we have the climate uh, warming. It will threaten the human beings existential and development. And we also have 1.06 uh, billion population that are without the electricity. And also a lot of people can use simple electricity rather than have to use woods for the cooking and heating. So that's why we are over-reliant on the fossil fuels. So that's why we have to develop low carbon and zero carbon clean energy. And actually, the renewables and clean energies are quite abundant in the world. So based upon our research, we really have to tap into these resources. Only by building GI with rates, can realize effective development allocation. For example, if we tap into these resources in Sahara Desert, only 77.7% 7 7 of the areas developed can address the resources issues. So that's why it is kind of a cubic meters with the length of 830 kilometers. It will give us a lot of resources and energy. But actually, for the energy resources or rich areas, they concentrated on some of the areas. So the wind and photovoltaic uh, power generation is intermittent and uh, volatile. So only by building GI with UHV backbone grades can we realize effective development, allocation, and use of wind resources to solve global energy issues from the root. And also address the resources security and climate change issues. And also, we have to promote two replacement, one increase and one restore, <coughs> so to address the resources restraint, two replacement. Clean replacement to replace fossil fuels with clean alternatives such as solar, wind, and hydro energies in energy production, and also electricity replacement means replace coal, oil, and gas by clean electricity from afar, and also one increase to increase the electrification. 1% increase in electricity's proportions in the used energy consumption means a 3.7% drop in energy intensity. One restore to restore fossil fuels basic attributes as the industrial raw material. In the past, fossil fuels used as a fuel but actually, we have to treat it as industrial raw material so that it can create more economic values. The economic value of crude oil per unit as a raw material is 1.6 times that of crude oil as fuel. So that's why we should definitely use it as a raw material rather than use it as a fuel. So that's why. If we use fossil fuels, it is quite irresponsible for us to do that. Because the GI is in line with the energy development law of cleanliness, electrification, and networking. Cleanliness refers to the trend that global energy systems will become more decarbonized with clean energy as the dominant energy source. In the late 19th century, coal replaced wood. In the 1960s, oil and natural gas replaced the coals. In the future, it will accelerate the transition to a clean and low-carbon model. Electrification indicates electricity will be more prominent in energy systems 
And electricity took up 8.8 percent in the use energy consumption in 1971, but actually uh, the electricity share in energy mix grew to be 18.5 percent in 2015, especially in North Europe. The electrification achieved a high level. Norway, 46 percent. Networking refers to global energy systems transition from local balance to global interconnection. Global coal, gas, and oil experienced from the point to point supply to regional, transactional, and global allocation. You can see this trend from the global coal, oil, gas, and power system. <coughs> We're going to establish a modern uh, energy systems with electricity at the core. Now we have the technically it is technically uh, feasible. The mature progressive and widely applied technologies on UHV power transmissions, clean generation, and smart grid. Now China is building a lot of UHV powers. And we have 35,000 kilometers of UHV power grid. And second, we have economic competitiveness. In the past five years, the energy powered by the renewable energies, especially the renewable energies, is more competitive than fossil fuels. In 2020, we have the photovoltaic project. In Saudi Arabia, we have a UAE that will be bring down for the successful PV power plant. By 2050, the renewable energies will be more competitive than fossil fuels by 2025. It doesn't mean that if you like it or not, or if you were engaged in oil, gas, wood. The trend has to change and transform. So you cannot uh, change it. You have to see the trend. And also you can see the great market demand by 2050. The power consumption will grow from 24 trillion kilowatts to 73 trillion kilowatts per hour is because the third thing is that the power consumption will grow from 24 trillion kilowatts per hour to 73 trillion kilowatts per hour. The Combating climate change and achieving sustainable development has become a common objective of the international community. As you know, in recent years, UK, Germany, and France, as well as India, have uh, released timetable to oil coal-fired plants and the uh, deadline for stopping construction of nuclear plants, and by 2030, uh, uh, they will ban the sale and the production <coughs> of oil-filled vehicles. Recently, China will also announce its uh, time to stop producing and selling gas and oil-fired uh, vehicles. 
The comprehensive value of GI is huge. GI has a bright future. And generally, we can define them as a domestic. Uh, intercontinental and intercontinental interconnection by 2050, we will basically construct uh, the GI, which will play a important role. Um, according to our mission, 2050, 2035, uh, 2015, 2035, and 2050 will be three stages. And by 2050, worldwide, we will build a GI similar to the information network we are familiar with, which has already provided us with great social and economic benefits. However, information internet has as even knowing it for the energy, global energy interconnection is still a concept. And uh, we will establish objectives and the roadmap to achieve that. First, we will ensure the energy supply. Clean energy will account for 80 percent in energy mix. From now on, if power consumption increases 12 percent annually by clean energy, will account for 80 percent in energy consumption. And this will address the 1.06 billion people without electricity. Secondly, on the climate change, we will significantly reduce the GHG emissions, the CO2 emissions emissions will uh, be contained to half of the level in 1990, and that will uh, contain global temperature rise within two degrees or even 1.5 degrees. And also we will make good use of different in time zones, seasons, uh, tariffs and resources across the nation in order to uh, have high complementation in energy resources. For example, uh, China and the U.S. has a 12 to 13 hours of time difference. Now China is still uh, in the early morning. So uh, we can transmit China's electricity to, to U.S. And uh, conversely, we can also uh, transmit uh, the power from U.S. to Europe and China. And the uh, power transmission is fast. Uh, therefore, if we build a GIA, we can allocate resources across continents and across countries. And that is a realistic solution. It's a high economic value. And now, during the vacations, we will drive cars uh, for vacation. And in the future, clean energy will be the same. And the clean energy can, can travel across continents and across countries. Fourth, uh, GI can drive economic growth, global power investment will exceed 50 trillion US dollars in emerging industries such as smart grid, which we and the global investment will develop. Fourth is fixes promote peace and harmony. Clean energy sharing and cooperation will be enhanced. And the political trust between countries will be enhanced. International conflicts, regional conflicts will be reduced. South-South cooperation, South-North cooperation will be promoted for common development. You know, uh, fossil fuels uh, have clear boundaries, and uh, uh, it creates uh, very strong political sensitivities. Uh, there are a lot of uh, conflicts or even wars uh, due to the fight for resources. However, clean energy has no boundaries. Overall, GEI focuses on sustainable development, which is the core task for the mankind, and it will play an important role in tackling the world's energy, economic, social, and environmental challenges. Now, I will shift my presentation to the Energy Information Transportation Integration, or EITI, uh, based on the GEI practices and the research in October 2016 in Stanford. University, I proposed uh, the concept of UITI, uh, that is to promote integration of energy information and transportation uh, networks or integration of uh, bits, watts, and meters. The purpose is to promote the world economic transformation and the upgrade. 
Yeah, and transportation networks uh, have a large audience, uh, large output, uh, and uh, they are great uh, economic drivers. They are economic pillars and innovation engines, as well as development bases. So these are the fundamental drivers. Uh, Multiplying, with uh, technical advances, I think in the future some professions uh, may vanish or disappear. They will be uh, replaced by AI or robots, robotics. Promoting AI with GI, uh, the three networks are, have mature technologies. And this has made the EIT possible. Global information networks with, uh, works with more than 250 submarine optical fiber cables and more than 500 communication satellites. And uh, this network uh, works well. 
川丘的铁路离地已经超过了一百三十万公里，高速公路的里程超过了二十三万公里，与信息网、交通网相比，能源网的互联明显滞后。为什么滞后？就是这几年电力特别电力特别电网的滞后。Thousand kilometer highways, and the energy internet lags behind compared with other two, because the grid and the transmission technologies lack innovations in recent years. With the technological breakthroughs in UHV grids, I think we have a promising future. Actually, the UHV technologies. Technology breakthroughs is very important uh, in the energy and the electricity sector, and this will improve the global energy networks to achieve EITI, because uh, the UHV grids can be a backbone uh, grid for building the uh, GEI, and uh, this will create necessary conditions for achieving EITI. Energy, information, and transportation networks are just like vascular nerve and the uh, systems and the four limbs. Energy networks is like a vascular system. Information network is like a nerve system. Transportation network is like four limbs. Uh, they have clear roles and responsibilities, and they are clearly integrated uh, based on the nerve system and the vascular system and the four limbs, uh, we can create a whole human bodies. And based on the um, nerve system and the four limbs, we can create a sound vascular system and achieve EITI. After you listen to my presentation, you may still have concerns. And I fully understand your concerns. And uh, I'm ready to answer your questions in the Q&A session. Building the GEI and promoting GEITI are innovative undertakings. Uh, they concern politics, diplomacy, economy, society, energy, environment, and infrastructure. And they require technical innovation, academic program development, and talent cultivation. It also provides broad development space for universities, experts, and scholars. I can give you an example. Of, like GEI, last year in China and worldwide, we accepted PhD students, uh, altogether 35 of them, to work with, to work for us. And last year in US, we recruited five uh, PhDs, PhDs. And this year, we just uh, completed our interviews. And this year in US, we have recruited nine PhDs to work for us. So I mean, uh, the development of uh, GEI will also promote the academic programs, technical innovations, and uh, it will also offer jobs uh, for the uh, newly graduates. And uh, it is my expectation that you will support and participate in these undertakings. And GEI DCO is ready to work with uh, Columbia University. Uh, to create a better future for the world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chairman Leo, for those very thoughtful, in fact, visionary remarks. I know they were of great interest to our audience, especially the end where you start offered the possibility of jobs to some of our students. And I'm sure that you'll be, you and your team will be approached after this meeting on that topic. I'd, I'd like to start with some technical questions um, uh, and, and ask you about your experience with ultra-high voltage transmission in China. Um, what, what type of losses, electric losses, do you experience on your ultra-high voltage transmission lines? For, for UHV, and in China, uh, we have applied it on a large scale. I just mentioned uh, the length of uh, uh, wires has reached uh, 55,000 kilometers. The capacity has reached uh, uh, 3.6 trillion kilowatts. 
and then we uh, the new projects are under construction. The technology has been exported. Uh, for example, the state grid has uh, invested in Brazil uh, two projects, uh, the DC projects, and both projects are under construction. And one project will be operate will uh, come on stream next year. Another will come on stream in 2015, uh, 2019. Uh, therefore, the HV technology is uh, very mature and uh, sophisticated. Just as uh, Professor Sandler uh, mentioned, uh, you are very concerned with the uh, line loss, and we know uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, there are some uh, laws uh, regarding the lo uh, line loss. The high voltage means uh, transmitting uh, transmitting the same uh, power, and the uh, loss will be low. According to our current design, um, 800 kF DC project, 2,000 kilometer, uh, the loss is uh, between 5 to 6 percent. Why it is variable? Uh, it relates to the investment. Investment re uh, decides the interface of the conduct lines. Uh, six contact lines or eight contact lines, whether the sectional uh, um, is uh, um, what size of the sectional and the power resistance will be different. Uh, so uh, overall, the higher the voltages for the transmitting the same uh, capacity, uh, the, capaci uh, the power capacity will be low and the loss will be low. Thank you. And could you talk to us about underwater ultra high voltage transmission lines? Uh, are there currently any underwater high voltage transmission lines in the world? And what type of technical innovation will be needed to have those lines go at great distances? Uh, onshore transmission is uh, most common. For the submarine or uh, subsea transmission, we also do it frequently. Uh, but so far, we do not have a UHV undersea transmission, and uh, there are no such transmission lines. And uh, the Europe, Europe uses a lot of uh, uh, subsea uh, wi uh, wires. Uh, the highest voltage is uh, 330 uh, kF, and the capacity is uh, 200 uh, kilowatts. And for the uh, intercontinental transmission, we have to address 800 kF uh, with a transmission capacity of uh, 500 kV. According to my uh, analysis, we don't have uh, major impediments to this technology. As long as there is demand, we are fully able to um, kick off this project. And uh, we have worked with uh, several c uh, major cable companies in the world, and we made uh, some uh, study. As long as there are uh, demand, we can uh, build it. For example, in Italy, Germany, and we worked with them and also we are focusing on the submarine uh, UHV and sometimes maybe it will be in China but maybe in some other countries. Thank you. I'd like to ask you just about your trip this week here also. I know you're in New York for a few days and I understand you're meeting at the United Nations with Secretary General Guterres. Could you tell us about, about your agenda here in New York and what you're doing at the United Nations? In this U.S. trip, I have been tasked with a lot of missions. I think today I visit the Columbia University. It is quite important. But in December, November the 1st, we're going to have a global energy interconnection roadmap or action plans to promote the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, high-level symposium. 
So a dozen of countries will send their representatives, and the Secretary General Guterres will make a speech. I will also have some speech to be made and have a keynote speech, and also working to come up with the GEI roadmap to the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. There are 17 objectives under the SDG. We have 10 actions and five mechanisms to respond to the action to address the poverty, environmental deterioration, unbalanced development. And also, we have to address those who cannot get access to electricity. And also, we have to address the topic of pursuing peace and development. And also, we have to talk about the climate change and Paris Accord. So my meetings at the UN is quite important. Um, thank you. So many, ex many uh, experts uh, in electricity today believe that we're moving into an era of distributed generation, particularly with solar power, where we're going to have lots of microgrids and lots of rooftop solar. Do you agree with that? Uh, do, you, do you see that happening? And is there any um, tension between having more distributed power on the one hand but also having a global energy interconnection. It takes time to give you a perfect answer, but actually I just want to give you a simple answer here. I think there is a technical issues, and also it has some like man-made issues. Some are science, some are pseudoscience. For example, when a subject is coming up, for example, there are uh, men and women here, which is better. So it's a pseudoscience. So for some theoretical uh, studies, there will be some pseudoscience research. I think grades should be integrated. We not only need UHV, also we need HV, and also we have other grades, like we have highways, tier two roads, and rural roads and trails. It is the system for power energy. We need centralized large-scale clean energies, and also we need distributed allocations and power generations. Which one is better? Which one is important? It depends on national conditions and different localities. If uh, distributed one is more adaptable, it will be better. But actually, some of the people just said the UHV embrace for the concentrated power generation is not the case. For example, in New York, if we have the solar panels installed on each roof under the other conditions, and actually every family is generate powers, if we're not going to generate all the electricity, who we're going to sell? If there is a surplus, of course we're going to have the surplus integrated into the grid. Through the global energy interconnections, those surplus of power generations in New York can be transmitted to China, to Europe, and thanks to the global energy interconnection, it will conducive to both concentrated and distributed power generation. So it will address a lot of issues. So thank you, Professor Sandlow, for coming up with this question so that I can address it in a straightforward manner. Uh, all right, I have a few more questions. Um, uh, 
you, you discuss in your presentation how the global energy interconnection can promote clean energy because we need um, transmission to get clean energy from where it's generated to where it's used. But those same interconnections can also be used to promote dirty energy. You could take a transmission line and use it to move electrons from an old-fashioned inefficient coal plant to a load center. So how do, as you develop the global energy interconnection, how do we make sure that it promotes the transition to clean energy and doesn't perpetuate the old dirty energy system? I think for the interconnections, it cannot distinguish whether it is clean or not. For example, highways, of course, we hope that in highways there are a lot of good vehicles, but actually it has nothing to do with the roads. It has something to do with the management of the roads. So for those dirty powers or other unclean energies, it has something to do with national policies and the management as well as the monitorings, rather than it has something to do with the interconnection. Uh, you, you spoke about uh, electric vehicles uh, as part of the transition to clean energy. Um, and could you just, could you talk about the future of electric vehicles as you see it and, and um, what is happening in China today in particular with respect to electric vehicles? Ah, but before you answer, Mr. Chairman, I see we're honored to have our dean arriving after her class. So Dean Jaina, welcome. Uh, delighted to have you here. Um, and please. Excuse my delay in joining you. I have the best reason in the university environment, which is that I was teaching a course until just a minute ago. So let me just uh, welcome Chairman Liu and your delegation here today. I'm really very delighted to thank you for joining us on behalf of President Bollinger and Columbia University. I know the chairman's had a very busy and productive stay in the United States and in New York, and I have been hearing about your visit as you have been meeting with the Secretary General, um, other important uh, local uh, CEOs and others. So thank you very, very much for making time to be with us. I'm particularly delighted that you have taken <coughs> this moment to come to the School of International and Public Affairs because we think of ourselves as the interdisciplinary hub of public policy research uh, and engagement. We think we take ideas into action and uh, thus having a chance to talk to a leader working on these issues uh, in China is, uh, is uh, very powerfully relevant uh, to us. We have a lot of faculty research uh, uh, focused on China, particularly around energy, climate, security, urban policy, and entrepreneurship. And indeed, uh, our student body is increasingly um, uh, Chinese as well. So now we have some 13% of our students at SIPA uh, are, are Chinese. And I'm particularly aware of the deep work that is developing uh, between our Center on Global Energy Policy uh, and Chinese counterparts. This academic year, y you may uh, be surprised to know that um, uh, we have collaborated already in a conference on global governance and innovation in governance with uh, Beida. 
uh, we will be uh, holding another uh, discussion and collaboration with Rem Min coming up quite soon. Uh, also with Chinhua in the spring. Uh, uh, and, and other institutions, private and public. And I understand that SIPA's <coughs> Center on Global Energy Policy and your own organization are planning some collaborative research uh, as well as uh, uh, several reports. So I look forward to hearing about that work um, and finding other ways uh, for us to collaborate um, uh, Columbia University and SIPA on the important work going on in China on uh, climate and energy uh, matters. I think what the U.S. and China can do together could not be more important uh, around these issues. So uh, with uh, this apology for just a brief visit with you, uh, let me thank you again for taking time to be with us. Uh, it's a great honor for us and a great opportunity to hear about progress in China. Thank you very much. Dean Jano, thank you very much for joining us. Um, well, let me uh, ask you about electric vehicles, uh, Chairman Leo, which you spoke about uh, in your remarks as part of electricity replacement. Um, what, what do you see as the future for electric vehicles? What impacts will they have on electric grids in the years ahead? Yes. I am a study of electricity, and I've been working as a chairman for the state grade of China for many years. And actually, I'm quite excited when you come up with this question. For electricity uh, vehicles, it's pretty much like we're in the birth center, we're expecting a lot of new babies and new lives. So of course, there will be some issues, but we will address those issues properly. Well, in a moment, I'm going to turn it over uh, uh, to the audience, well, I know there's lots of expertise in the audience and lots of questions that people want to ask you. But let me ask you a, a few more questions um, before I do that. Um, and, and let me ask, I want to pass along um, the um, concern that I hear most frequently about the global energy interconnection from experts that I speak with. Um, what I often hear people say is that this, a global energy interconnection may be possible from a technological standpoint but from a political and institutional standpoint, it would be very challenging. People say countries do not want to connect to other countries who might cut off their electricity supplies. Uh, and in addition, there's a lot of concern about cyber attacks on grids. And so additional electricity interconnections would only increase vulnerability. Um, so I wonder, um, what are your thoughts? Uh, we've been mainly talking about the technology so far. But from a political and institutional standpoint, um, what are your thoughts about the feasibility of progress towards a global energy interconnection? I think the issue of security is critical. If it is not safe, we're not going to do that. That is our principle and precondition. Comparatively speaking, information networking has been established. Is it safe? Of course, there are some uncertainties and uh, safety issues, but actually it is established. I think the global energy interconnection, there will be some issues or hackers along the road. For example, in the United States and Russia, 
there are a lot of political disagreements between the two countries. But actually, the United States and Russia didn't cut off their electricity, especially on the information highways. Actually, we established a trust in the information highway. I think we can do it in energy sector as well. For energy issues, we have to change our mindset and liberate our mindset. In the past, we have energy security issues, which means we have to have resources within our own country. But in the future, it should be, be like that. For clean energy, it is not sensitive to the national security. It is not sensitive to geopolitics. Besides, if the interconnection, if it is market-based, it will address a lot of issues. For example, a lot of clothes in the United States are manufactured in China and other Asian countries. You are not going to say if China is going to cut off the manufacturers, people in the United States won't have any clothes to wear. But actually, if there is one line cut off, there will be other lines. So based upon my research, to be blunt, the interconnection is quite safe, quite safer than the past approach. For example, like we have the same worries about airplanes, because airplanes is the safest uh, travel mode if compared to driving a car. So that's the same case. Okay, my last question before turning it to the audience is, is a very general one, but you, you, sm you spoke some about climate change. Could you just speak about um, that topic? How big of a threat do you think climate change is and uh, for, for the future of humanity and, and what, broad, what we need to do to address it? Climate change presents a lot of issues. And the most important one is uh, the, it threatens the human existence. That's the big greatest concern. That's the greatest risk we face. Therefore, climate change is uh, the enemy for the, all humankind, every region. Religion and political party should adopt the same attitude towards climate change. Otherwise, it will be confusing. Thank you. Now, um, uh, thank you. I, I, okay, I want to add something. Actually, uh, uh, he raised two questions, I, and I only answered one of them. So I want to touch upon the other one. How to address the climate change issue? I think uh, we need GEI. How can GEI address climate change? Two replacements. Clean energy replace fossil fuels, that is uh, electricity produced by coal, oil. Now we use uh, hydropower, solar power. We do not use uh, fossil fuel to generate the power, and then we do not produce, exploit, store, or transport fossil fuels, and this will reduce the carbon emissions. I also mentioned every year, globally, if uh, clean energy can grow at an annual rate of 12% by 2050, the worldwide energy mix will can have 80% uh, share attributed to energy, uh, clean energy, and the carbon emission will be restored to the 90s of last year, uh, half of the level in the 90s of the last century. Without the clean energy by 2050, China, uh, the world will consume 30 billion standard coal, and the emission will exceed the capacity of four planets, and that will be a disaster. So uh, overall speaking, I think GEI, clean development, clean replacement, clean consumption, can address the sustainability issue of, for the man. 
Uh, thank you. Um, start right here, and uh, if you could wait for a microphone for the translators, and please identify yourself. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much. I'm a PhD candidate at University of Waterloo in Canada, and I just moved here. I've, I live here, but I'm just defending my thesis by January, February. What you mentioned, that intracontinental proposal promotion or conceptual framework that you need, I just uh, completed my uh, paper, and uh, it's just been accepted by Energy of Journal of Energy Policy, where we define these region, we call it regional energy hub, from four parameters. Geopolitical parameter, economical, environmental, and financial. Where we see its challenges, and Mr. Uh, Professor also identified that uh, geopolitical parameter is most, uh, I, I don't want to say risk, most riskful parameter that we see, we estimate it, but it requires a lot of international cooperation at the UN level, which is perfect that that's UN is part of this. But when I forecast it, we are forecasting about 15 to 20 regional energy hubs around the world. But when it comes to it, like you said, UHV is the most important backbone of the vision. However, when it comes to it with from our studies, we found that regional energy hubs, when it comes to it, in order for countries to collectively move forward for the COP21 targets, I just want to say it comes to the investment decision, financial engineering, because most investments will value generation assets over transmission. This is happening in UK, this is happening in PJM. Capacity markets work well, but when it comes to transmission investment, it will take some time and ba basically Thank you. The, the boost right. of the uh, financiers, I think. What do you think about that? Thank you for your question, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, we're gonna, before the chairman answers, um, his staff has told me that he would like to pre formally present one of his books to Dean Jaina, who must leave. So he's going to do that, um, and then we'll get to the answer to your very interesting question. So, um, Chairman Neo, if you would like to present your books to uh, Dean Jaina, we'd be honored to receive them here at Columbia. well, thank you very much again for coming. Um, and, and your question, sir, as I understood it, was the, the question was on investment in transmission. Um, in particular, um, and investment in transmission is compared to generation. Um, and uh, Chairman Leo. I think we need to take a market-based or commodity economy approach when it comes to investment and economics and the return of investment, whether we can make money from our investment, we need to, we need to do some calculation. And some, some are concerned about, the loss, about losing money. Actually, it may not be the case. Actually, in, in the world, uh, the, high, the highest volume of hydro power is uh, on the Congo River. It has 100 million kilowatt. They installed the Grand Inga. Uh, if uh, it can trans be transmitted to Europe, uh, it will travel 6,000 kilometers. Is it economic? Some say it's too long 
to be economic. But after calculation, you will see from Grand Inga to Europe, it will make a lot of profits. If we develop hydropower in Grand Inga, every kilowatt hour is only three US cents. And if we transmit this hydropower to Europe, uh, the transmission is a fee cost is a three cents. So from Africa, Congo, Congo to Germany, uh, it travels 6,000 to 7,000 kilometers. The landing tariff is uh, seven cents US dollars. So it's very low. Compared to the power price in Germany, the industrial sector pays 15 euro cents every kilowatt hour for a household is 25 cents Europe euros euro cents so uh, the long distance transmission can make profits just like international tr uh, trade uh, from Asia to Europe and the uh, US sometimes uh, it's uh, more cost effective than the local made products that's why we have international trade and international uh, commodity flow that that's uh, the electricity is the same case. And in the future, electricity is the key commodity we trade across nations because it's very economic. And uh, for example, in the US, Thank you. Our next question is right. Uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. That was a very enlightening uh, talk for us. Uh, my name is Emre Tipoğlu. I'm a visiting Fulbright Scholar at uh, Saqib Sabancı Center for Turkish Studies here at Columbia University. And I want to follow up on uh, Mr. Sandalov's uh, one of his final questions on uh, interstate relations and whether, you know, that would be conducive to such investments. Uh, your answer was mostly on a bilateral basis. So you gave the example of Russia versus U.S., Another interesting example is Qatar still allowing gas to go to UAE instead, despite the sanctions that have been imposed upon them. But uh, the framework that you have uh, presented is a multilateral one in many respects. It's going to traverse many countries. There will be critical hubs, and there it will be uh, close to conflict hotspots and whatnot. Um, and as such, my question to you is: Is the current global order? or the current multilateral cooperation schemes sufficient to overcome challenges that uh, the, the cooperation challenges that such a system would pose? Or uh, are we suggesting something on top of what we already have in the global governance system? Thank you. I think for GI, whether we can build it successfully, we have to take three factors into consideration. Technology, economics, and politics. I mentioned te technologically feasible, economically viable, and for politically, I think it serves needs of every people, every person on the planet, every national of uh, each country and every political will of uh, politicians because they have to gain the votes. If they can provide clean, affordable electricity to population, they can gain votes. So why they reject it? Therefore, we have to consider the fundamental interests of everyone, every stakeholder. Of course, some people, some countries, uh, due to historical, cultural reasons, initially they will resist uh, such uh, idea. But I believe in the very end, when they consider the economic value and the polit polit political value, they will accept this concept. Just uh, as I mentioned, why we have uh, international trade? Why no single country produces everything for itself? Why every country imports? So that's the same logic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm a P PhD alumni from Columbia University. And my question has to do with the issue of the electric car. There are many that see the electric car as a solution to the problem of global emissions. But the hard fact remains that 
we have five years, if that much, to reduce emissions by automobiles, that there are two, two billion automobiles on the road in the world, and they, the, those two billion cars have to be replaced. I would like to ask you if China is going to be able to replace its automobiles of electric cars in that period of time. And if not, what other contingency you have to deal with the problem? It's a very uh, important question to the point. Actually, in my current capacity, I cannot answer it. I should uh, ask Premier, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang to answer this important question. But I can share with uh, you some of my personal obs observation. I believe China is likely by 2030 and 2040 during this period will announce to stop producing and selling diesel or gasoline vehicles. Even at this pace, China will face a lot of uh, pressure uh, because we need to boost the uh, production capacity of the EVs and we need to phase out old production capacity for old cars. And there is a question we need to elaborate. The transformation of a world energy landscape uh, the transformation of a vehicle fleet is a process. And uh, we need to be very cautious not to capsize because it carries risk, both risks and opportunities. Some unknown small companies, if they can take the opportunity, can grow into transnational companies. And some tra big companies may go broke during this process if they do not make informed decisions. Therefore, uh, this process is scary, but it will happen. I also uh, think about, it, uh, about this question. Uh, but I will not engage in speculation and in taking the uh, challenges because at my age, I need to be conservative and cautious. Uh, thank you, Chairman Liu. I'm from a sustainable, a sustainability major uh, of uh, Columbia University. My question is, uh, as a Chinese citizen, as an ordinary citizen of China, how can we help to build GEI? Uh, and you said every national is a beneficiary of a clean and uh, affordable uh, energy. So as a, a citizen of a country, how can we promote the development of GEI? Thank you. The user and the consumer, that's your role. I think uh, from your bottom of your heart, you need to support uh, GEI. You do not oppose to this idea. So that's the basic requirement for every citizen. You need to support the GEI so you can use uh, clean and affordable electricity uh, at an early date. And for Chinese, for Chinese citizens, uh, they are entitled to this uh, uh, benefit. And uh, if everyone can have uh, clean and affordable electricity from GEI, it will be a common uh, benefit for everyone, and it will make everyone happy. Uh, Hi, Chairman Liu. I'm from Energy's uh, Department of uh, the World uh, Bank, and you mentioned that, uh, that the GI can help uh, Africa uh, to increase the electricity consumption, but in, uh, Africa lacks uh, infrastructures like uh, uh, transmission and uh, uh, distribution networks. So how can GI address that bottleneck? Thank you. And as you know, the per capita power consumption in Africa is very low. Why? One, one reason, poverty. Second reason, lack of money. They are poor and a lack of money, so they do not consume as uh, much uh, electricity as other countries, but they still need it. So the issue, the challenge for us is to how to trans transform resource advantage into economic advantage. I just mentioned Grand Inga hydropower. 
40 million kilowatt in stored capacity, largest in the world. And the uh, generation cost is very low. If uh, it can be sold to Europe, and every kilowatt hour will earn five cents for African people, and every year, how much profits can they reap? And they can use that money to uh, promote the development of industry and agriculture. So it's mutually reinforcing. And if we look at the Sahara Desert in North Africa, in the future, I think that's a treasure because it's close to equator. The, it has uh, solar resources every year. The, uh, the sunlight hours can reach 3,800 hours. If we translate uh, this uh, solar resource into electricity, it can also generate a lot of economic value for North Africa or Sahara Desert. So if we translate the resource advantage into economic advantage, uh, we can promote development of uh, GI and electric electricity industry. So it's a mutually reinforcing process. My name is Wang Hao. I'm a master student in CIPA. Before I come to study in CIPA, I worked in a nuclear plant uh, in China. And in your speech, you mentioned the nuclear power in the future in the GI. What role will nuclear power play? I think uh, it is a good base load uh, generate, generator, but do you think it will be a transitional fuel and we, it will be phased out in the near future? Can you answer this question? I want to uh, use your final part of your question as my answer. Actually, your question provides answer by itself. Uh, because if we look at it, if, we, if I answer this question, I may offend a lot of people. But I still need to be blunt and straightforward. I have to be honest today, even to offend some people. And in the future, we are concerned about the safety of nuclear power. To address nuclear, to address safety issue, uh, we increase the costs, and that increase the tariff of uh, nuclear power. So that's a vicious circle. For the prospects of nuclear power, I think the key is uh, its economics and the competitiveness. If we we can assume, if a solar power, just like I said, 1.8, 1.9, or 2.4 cents per kilowatt hour, how can nuclear power compete? Even if it, even it is clean and nice, who, who will buy it? Because if you sell nuclear power, you lose money. If you don't sell, you need to stop the generators. So your question actually provides your answer. Thank you. Chairman Liu for the wonderful speech. I'm a SIPA student, and also I studied uh, my undergraduate at Tsinghua University, and actually I just said how we can make a contribution as a citizen to build the GEI, but for the GEI Guide Co., how are you going to use the international negotiations to build the GEI? For example, are you going to hire some of the students like us so as to promote the international cooperation so that you can implement these policies into real action? Yes. One of the key purposes of today's visit is like this. I think you just spelled out the beans which means we would like to have some international students to promote our cooperation and communication so as to promote the development of GEI. I know SIPA is quite renowned, so that's why we would like to learn from you guys and hire some of the students here. Yeah, I think your visit is already a success. Mr. Well, Chairman, thank you very much. Other questions? Hey, David Kahn. Hey, 
你你你你好了，刘刘刘刘主席啊，我叫张小芒，我是那个嗯西北创新工厂的一个。A CEO from the North East China Innovation Factory. I have a quick question. Electricity is a very important vehicle. If we electrified everything, do you think it will address all the issues? For example. Mobile issues. If we use e-cars or electronic vehicles, do you think we can address all the issues like ferry boat, airplanes? Can we use batteries or electricities to power them at all? Of course, we have to use liquefied fuels. So, do you think electricity, together with other electric Liquefied fuels to address all the issues. Do you think we can achieve that? I think you are quite objective. So that's why I have to use a wise way to answer your question. I think we are developing a ways that is centered on electricity. But it doesn't mean that we are going to have 100% electricity to power everything. But for a certain kind of region or for certain kind of things, we're going to use electricity 100%. But worldwide, maybe not. Just as what you have said, ferry boat, airplanes, whether we can use electricity to power them all, I hope one day we can achieve that. For example, we have the battery-powered airplanes. As long as we address the battery security and recharging issues, definitely we can make it applicable to other things like submarines and other things. I think this is the same logic, right? So on, on the topic of batteries, Mr. Chairman, do you think that uh, do you think electricity storage is going to play a big role in electric grids in the decades ahead? For electricity and battery storage, we are focusing on the development or breakthrough of the technology of the battery storage. Europe, China, and the U.S. have different approaches to that, and we are trying to make breakthrough. I believe that there will be key breakthroughs in the future. On the other hand, I want to talk about the battery storage. If we have the grids interconnections, maybe we can have the battery storage as well, it will be more powerful because we have seasonalities and time zones and tariff differences. So if we are going to use the connected powers, we can also store electricity on the other hand, right? I'm from Taiwan. I'm a student from SIPA. I'm a student of natural science. I studied fault lines. I think your answer is quite clear. But in Taiwan, for the fear of nuclear energy, since I'm a science student, if we have that belief, Maybe sometimes the science cannot defeat our fate. But actually, for the renewable energy in Germany, it has nuclear free. But for Chinese government, what's your outlook and vision? How, to what kind of extent, that you're going to be nuclear free? Especially depends on solar energy and wind energy. I think you're from Taiwan. I feel a great affinity to you. But actually, please convey the message to your Taiwanese people. I think we have different ideas on nuclear energies. 
I think Taiwan likes electricity a lot. But Taiwan is quite close to the mainland of China. So we can address these issues, use submarine, uh, the, uh, the cable. As long as we reach agreement, definitely everything can be addressed. For China, how are we going to develop the clean energy? I'm going to give you some statistics. Currently, the hydro installed capacity for hydropower is 330 million kilowatts, and wind power from number one, and also of solar panel energy installed capacity ranked number one. So actually of renewable energy installed capacities ranked number one. And it also accounts for 36% of the power generated in China. So that's why China is a leader in renewable energy power generation. That's because the Chinese government focuses on the renewable energies. The Chinese people wants that. And also China's UHV trade technologies make that possible. For example, the hydropowers from the west in China is quite close to the load centers. But actually using the UHV grids, we can transmit the electricity from west to uh, the load centers. As far as like 6,000 kilometers. It's pretty much like the shooting range of ballistic missiles. So that's why we can definitely transmit the powers to every corner of China. It is also applicable to the United States. UHV grids, right? Mr. Chairman, we are almost out of time. Um, uh, before we close, I just would like to ask you if you have any final remarks that you would like to offer, and, and thank you very much for sharing your valuable time with us here. I think I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to show what I want to say today in candid way. I want to thank all the faculties, students, friends attending this event. I think your attendance is making my message possible. And second, let's bring back to the topics of today. I hope you can support, believe the development of global energy interconnection. I think the concept is quite unfamiliar to you. It is also a young concept. It is in its infancy. It's pretty much like three to four years old. After 2012, this concept came into being. It's because I was inspired by the global information interconnectivity, because the information-based connectivity make the globe a global village. So that's why we believe we can do that. So our book. My book was published in uh, February 2015, and also I have English editions. Why? It's because we want to publicize the book before the 17th anniversary of the UN and the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Agenda's signing. I think this project is quite important. So I hope you guys can support and believe it that so that we can achieve that goal as early as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us.